Ladies, gentlemen, am I often forgotten, but certainly not by me. Bo's the Last Guardian, welcome to the channel, and welcome to another video. In this video, I'm going to basically doing kind of a review and talk through of the Bow of the Last Guardian by itself. I was originally going to do this in the form of a range DPS guide update and just have it in there as how it integrates into the overall ecosystem and how it integrates with range and kind of that way. But I figured that with all of the information, all of the hype and uh, kind of back and forth discussion this bow has created, which it's probably one of the most talked about items I've seen of kind of since FSOA release, honestly. It's created quite the hype, and so I kind of wanted to break it into its own video and give just a totally flat, unbiased, you know, these are my thoughts, these are my findings, uh, things that I've talked to with other people who have the bow, just a general flat out thing. I'm not here to clickbait you or do anything like that i'm just giving you my honest thoughts on this item so with that being said i wanted to move into what this bow is not uh what is what do i mean by that i've seen a lot of hype around this bow based on some preliminary information that had come out talking about how this bow is the new best in slot item to be used everywhere it's going to absolutely destroy fsoa it is the underdog fsoa killer coming here to ruin magic once and for all and to be quite frank with you guys that is not the case uh fsoa in my opinion delving into the issue a little bit more it is a grotesquely overpowered item for a single weapon release uh, I think everyone can pretty much agree on that point at this point, however, I am not speaking on what should be done about it, I am just simply making a statement that it is very overpowered in terms of a single slot item. And being that it is extremely overpowered for being a single weapon, I do not believe that any other weapon release honestly should be on that scale of an update. You know, I pretty much will agree that a regimented but enjoyable and exciting uh, release of power creep is the way to go if we want to bring new weapons into the game. And since we're on T95, we're going to be seeing more of those. We now have the Lang Swords, we have EZK, we have the FSOA, and now we have the tier 95 bow. So in the tier 95 bracket, we have on the weapon side left, we have magic dual wield and range dual wield to see that's going to be coming hopefully in the future at some point, but uh, we'll see what comes of that. Now on the flip side, I've also seen a lot of people talking about how the bow is an absolute flop of an update. It's trash, you know, it's too complicated. There's things like that. There's a lot of feelings and emotion that go on with uh, quite such an anticipated release. And that's to be expected, honestly. That's kind of human nature and how we work. Uh, when we really anticipate something, we have a lot of high expectations. You're going to see a lot of high energy arguments on both sides of the aisle talking about the item and kind of clashing with each other that's just how we work in kind of this day and age and just in general and as we discover with most things in life the truth is somewhere mixed in the middle with parts coming from both sides of these extreme arguments being that the bow is not trashed here it is not god tier it is right in the middle and it is where i believe it is a perfectly balanced update for this game and for range it is a new interesting take on a way to do range damage by introducing a special attack that is nicely suited for some of the god arrows that we have already implemented into game and for generally fitting into how range works in the first place the passive ability mixed with the special attack that it has and how those two synergize together i think fits pretty well into the overall range meta and i'm interested to see in the future how this weapon is made even better by possibly a new armor set or new arrow types or possibly the dual wields and whatever passives those may have in the future and it'll be overall exciting to see how t95 range is fully flushed out into the game and now with all those talking points out of the way let's go ahead and dive into what actually makes this weapon tick so what is the Bow of the Last Guardian? This is a tier 95 bow with a passive and special attack that uses arrows. It does not use Hydrix or Ruby but Criminal Bolts, it doesn't use any of the bolts, it uses arrows. So the paired ammo for this in theory is the tier 95 Dyne arrow, or Dyne arrow, however you want to enunciate it. 
as a base, and then you can go ahead and enchant those into the four different types of god arrows that are currently in the game. This bow is also not a charge bow, it does not act like SGB does, where it has its own ammo source. It has to have some type of ammo source feeding this, whether it comes from just straight arrows in your quiver, or you buy a Pernix quiver, or something like that. Wherever you get your ammo source, you do need one. And if you are going to use this bow, I would recommend getting a Pernix quiver, so you can have a bolt type and an arrow type in there to switch between dual wield and two hand, to take advantage of all of the effects that both of them can offer. And what's nice about this bow is it introduces a special attack with a passive that work with each other. So the passive effect of this bow is every eight uh, hit splats. So not eight abilities, every eight hit splats. Bleeds do not count. And there's a couple other stipulations in there, but basically every eighth hit, depending on what ability you use to trigger this passive. So say you have... Um, you hit Gricko as your first ability, that'll put you at 7 already. Whatever you use as your next ability will trigger the passive, and the passive will grant an additional hit splat to whatever you did. So, if you hit SGB, you get an extra SGB arrow in theory. If you use Debo, you get a third Debo hit. If you use Snap, you get a third Snapshot hit. And that's how this goes. Now, the special attack itself will cut this passive effect down to four, and it will launch its own hit out. And honestly, the hit from the special attack the bow has is very strong. Inside of DS, this thing pretty much will hit anywhere from an 8 to a 10k, so it's kind of like anywhere from 16 to 20k damage assuming you activate it in the uh, correct window for the passive. So this adds an interesting style of doing damage where instead of just, you know, the classic method of button mash and ask questions later, uh, you actually have to start thinking about your rotations and timing things a certain way and kind of fitting around the bow. It is an interesting method to learn. It can take a little bit of time, but it didn't take me too long. I'd say within two or three hours of using this in kind of a more casual environment, uh, just running through some bosses, I started to figure it out, and then over the next couple of days, I started to get the hang of it quite a bit. As far as perk recommendations go, I would just go with the standard Precise 6 Aftershock 1 and Groming 4 equal 2, as you see here. And overall, this is a pretty strong bow, and it is a pretty strong effect and special attack that it has. Now we're going to talk about the places I actually brought this bow to for testing and to see where it actually works at. So the noteworthy places I brought this bow to were all three of the elite dungeons. I brought this to Glacor, I brought it to Solak, I did a couple hours of Rago, and there's a couple other bosses mixed in there that I'll make note to of later on, but these are kind of like the main areas where I tested it. I already know from friends who own the bow and from other tests on stream and watching other people that this bow is very strong at Zamorak. Uh, I know it's very strong there, so I didn't really want to include that as a test bed. Plus, it is a unique boss encounter where you're basically just stuffed full of adrenaline there, and I didn't think that would be a very fair test, although I will talk about kind of adrenaline as an issue and whatnot when I go into some of the uh, potential drawbacks and who I recommend this bow for at the end of the video. So first on the list is Elite Dungeon 1 or Temple of Amanishi as it's known. So before when I used to use range here it was more of a casual sense. I've never been the absolute fastest uh, person here and especially when I used range I would get about four runs an hour uh, with the older setups uh, post Gricko nerf I believe is when I did a lot of my finishing KC here for some of my KC goals and whatnot and I would get about four runs an hour sometimes a little bit more like maybe four and a half if I really pushed it but honestly I just felt four an hour ED1 was kind of just a nice casual rate to go through and just use chins to AoE clear everything. Maybe some of the single targets, or if there's only like a set of two and they're kind of annoying, just like when you go through the uh, the second door that leads you to the melee room, the two mobs up there, you could use the bow spec to maybe kill them a little bit faster, because uh, getting them into a chin spot while going fast is kind of annoying. But mainly where I found the benefit of the bow here is getting off a bunch of damage onto the bosses and bringing the boss times down a little bit more. Uh, with this setup, 
I found one cycle a lot more consistent. I would this was one of the uh, kind of earlier places I tested it, and I was not fully uh, used to the bow. I think this was the third place I tested because I started at ED2, and then I went to ED3, and then I came here. And I was getting used to the bow, but I wasn't quite used to it, and I hadn't really figured out a rotation yet for uh, one cycle specifically, but I felt the damage increase on the crystals quite drastically, mainly because it's just another special attack for you to use to get out extra hits, especially the bow spec itself doing a 10k. It was very nice, and I do rec if you like range ED1, I definitely recommend picking up a bow if you have the spare GP here. Now... When it comes to overall recommendations for the bow, I will go ahead and make a end clip after all of the different testing places and give my overall verdict there, but definitely a pretty good uh, item to use here at ED1. I believe magic is still faster overall just because of G-Chain working on most of the trash mobs effectively. There aren't too many mobs that really need Shin's AoE damage and G-Con can sort of skirt by, so... I'm pretty sure Magic is still going to hold the record here, and I believe it is going to hold top kills per hour, but range is definitely a nice alternative right now for this dungeon. ED2, or the Dragonkin Laboratory as it's known as, is probably the most anticipated place that I wanted to test that at for myself. Um, when the God Arrows came into game, I was always excited about the Dragonkin Arrows, the or the Dragon Bane Arrows, I should say, that give 30% damage increase and 20%, let me say that again, 30% damage increase. Like, these are massively powerful arrows. And when I would do range runs when they came out, I just used a physical SGB and I was getting some really good times for my personal runs anyway, you know, compared to what other people can do. You know, a lot of people can do a lot faster with just normal stuff, but me, I was noticing quite the increase using these arrows. And when the bow came out, I was I thought to myself, man, that's going to be really fun for ED2. Now, specifically for me, I'm still farming out a thousand solos of each dungeon. It's a long-term goal. It's been on the back burner for a few months now, but when I saw the bow release, I was like, I'm going to use that weapon to do the rest of the KC. And when I brought it here, I was not disappointed by the results. Uh, this bow is very strong here here. However, it ties into my original point of this bow being that it is not the FSOA killer because I know what my standard magic runs are like here. I know what times they can produce. And when I was testing these arrows, my, like this bow was on a 30% damage arrow that like the most ridiculous damage increase you could ever find in this game ever for probably a 70% of the mobs in the dungeon. And the range times were competitive with Magic, and that's what I think really shows some of the future updates that could be coming to this bow to help it grow past it and stronger in these areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the video about my you know, overall strengths and weaknesses, potential items that could be coming in the future to help it out and whatnot, but here it was a lot of fun. I used uh, just a standard setup with... Uh, Dragon Slayer, uh, Dragon Slayer, uh, Dragon Slayer perk and the sigil. I was not on task for any of these. I don't run this dungeon on task anymore. I used to try and farm tasks, but it got really obnoxious, and I prefer to just carry a note on task if I want to go to care pack. So uh, I digress nonetheless. The boss times I got were pretty noticeable. Uh, as far the biggest increase I saw was on BSD and how much damage I could get out there. With a Stellar, and we've been able to get sub 45 second kills since before Gricko came out, just because of how strong SGB spec was. SGB spec has been able to carry a Stellarn into hyperspeed for the longest amount of time, and it's been really fun to do. And so, like when EOFs came out, it's been ridiculous. This like a Stellarn is easily the most melted boss. So honestly, I didn't see too much difference there. Maybe I was getting some more consistent sub 40s than I usually would because the extra hits helped 
mitigate a little bit of RNG, or if there are some setup wizards out there who could make it, you know, more consistent on the 35 second front rather than the 40, you could find a little bit of time save here, but honestly, I don't notice too much of a difference as Stellar, but that's more so the boss itself rather than the difference between range with and without the bow. At Varak Lith, I noticed quite, uh, I'd say about a 15 second difference is what I've noticed. With using a physical SGB with the arrows, the nice thing is all I had to worry about using a physical SGB with the arrows was I had an ECB spec, that's all I had to worry about doing inside of a DS, and that would, you know, if the physical SGB was already there, I just used that as a spec, get two of those off per DS, and just worry about getting ECB off for like the last 15 seconds of DS is usually what I aim for, being that that's how long it lasts. The problem I ran into here and trying to find setups to work as I was having to start I was having to start uh, implementing incendiary shot and natty instinct before I would run into a boss encounter to try and help with a little bit of the adrenaline starvation that I've noticed with this weapon because we have a Debo EOF there is a SGB EOF, there is an ECB EOF, and now there is a bow spec. And all of these, all on their own, dark bow is only the real spec that costs a lot of adrenaline. It's hard to get adrenaline with this bow unless you're doing things like natty instincting and using incendiary shot and other kind of uh, more advanced or kind of more off-the-cuff type of rotations to build up extra adrenaline and really pull everything together and it's something i've noticed throughout all of my testing so far is the bow is very much adrenaline starved now i was still able to basically ignore ecb spec uh, due to adrenaline cost reasons and i was still able to get some pretty fast kills i noticed on varak i was in the like 110 to 120 range uh, my average kill is around the mid-120s, and before 125, I believe was a fast kill for me on a physical SGB using the arrows. So there's quite a bit of time save here for Varric, and that's on a boss that, you know, is 600,000 HP being done in, you know, a minute, minute and a half time frame. That's really good for in terms of damage. However, to compare it to magic, these are about the same times I've noticed using magic and really getting that in full tilt. I'm at about the same pace now with range and magic. Again, I'm sure there's some wizard with range out there who knows exactly what they're doing and can go faster than me, but I'm just speaking from my experience and what I found in my testing. Blackstone Dragon, I noticed the biggest increase. Uh, I was able to get quite a bit of HP done in terms of going for a flight skip. Uh, I noticed the HP values were a lot lower using the bow uh, compared to old runs, and it felt a lot stronger here, and my range times were quite very much on par with magic times. Now, again, I keep reiterating this, I am using the Dragonbane arrows, or the Jazz Dragonbane arrows. They are extremely powerful, and as soon as this combat style gets uh, a future update to help with a little bit of the Adren problems, this is going to be a very strong case for this bow, and I recommend it here if you can get it. At ED3, or the Shadow Reef as it's also known as, I used two different setups. One was a poison-based setup using Blood Reaver, Vamp Aura, and Bic Arrows to try and get as much poison damage out as possible, because when you're using Bic Arrows and all of these things synergize kind of nicely, the weapon damage goes absolutely through the roof, and you will see anywhere from 4 to 6k hit splats just from weapon poison alone, and Blood Reaver hits based, uh, Blood Reaver will put out hits based on healing, and it's stacking with your weapon poison, triple plus potion, and your cinders, so you're just seeing a wall of poison hits once it's all built up, and it's quite a fun setup and quite a relaxing setup, although it was slower in most use cases. Um, I'll talk about this again when I get to Solak. However, it is a fun and interesting setup, and you know, it's something that's there for if you uh, are trying to aura save, say you're down on refresh or something, you could do a poison setup with this bow, and it works rather well. However, the other setup I used was just a full damage setup using Ripper Demon and full arrows. And if I needed accuracy, I think I brought when arrows, but honestly for Crassian, I didn't notice too many accuracy problems. Um, and I was able to get some decent times at these bosses. It felt com 
kind of comparable to Magic. I think ED3, um, it's definitely my weakest dungeon as far as range runs are concerned. Um, going back to kind of record pace, range here held the record for quite a while until Magic kind of came and just took the dub from the range runs, but it was still quite a uh, solid method, able to muster out, you know, four runs an hour, sometimes even four and a half to five runs an hour on some very fast paces. And I believe the style range right now could do five an hour, and bow can certainly help with that. However, I didn't notice too many differences using the bow. I will say the biggest difference I noticed was at Ambassador and Crassian. Crassian, I was able to pretty much get into the sub 50 second area for kills rather consistently, even on the poison setup. The poison setup surprisingly worked really well at Crassian, even though it's a short boss fight. The other setup did just as well, even if not slightly better. Uh, anywhere in the 50 to the mid 50s to the high 40 second range in terms of boss times. Uh, for reference, Magic, I was doing anywhere from mid 30s to high 50s, just to, or mid mid 30s to low 50s is what I would get. Just completely dependent on crit RNG. So I guess that is one positive you can give to the bow is it's a bit more consistent, although your potential time is a lot faster with magic. But Karassian's kind of just one of those oddity bosses. You can't take advantage of SGB, so range is not going to be too viable in the first place. Terraket, or Parakeet as I like to jokingly call him, is uh, it's an interesting one, but I didn't notice too many advantages from bow, being that most of the fight I honestly just used chins to kill both of the bloats, and just kind of chin off of Parakeet in the center. I don't really use my two-hand weapon all too much until all of the uh, bloats are dead and other skeletons and whatnot. I, I just, I use chins there. I don't notice a difference. Maybe I was getting faster times. I think I had a couple kills in like the 150s, one f like low 150s, high 140s. I'm sure there's plenty of people who can do a lot better, uh, being as this is probably my weakest dungeon with range. The biggest increase I noticed, though, was with Ambassador. My Ambassador times were down into the low threes, which was definitely a new realm for me as far as range times are concerned. I think beforehand I had a high 330s with range when Greco was out, and this was probably late 2020, early 2021 as a time frame reference. I noticed quite a bit of improvement here. Uh, the poison setup was hilarious to use because what you can do is you can build up stacks on uh, phase one, and then during the Roomba phase, when you're going around and killing all the little spinners, you can just occasionally tag Ambassador to keep the poison stacks up. And you can really can't crank out some damage on Phase 3. Phase 3 can go pretty fast, so I did notice some... Uh, good times with the poison setup. The other setup I'm pretty sure was faster, so it's kind of a hit or miss there. As a general rule of thumb, I will say a poison setup is much more oriented towards a longer boss fight uh, rather than something short. I'd say, you know, something over the five minute mark that can accept weapon poison, which there's only one or two bosses in the game that really fall into that category right now, one being High End Rage Glacor, the other being Solak, but Solak honestly is getting to that point to where it's not really worthwhile. Anyways, I'm, I'm digressing off of ED3 here. Overall, range is a fun style here. It is not, for personally for me, it is not as fast as magic, but that's also probably just me getting used to range, and I'd have to probably just redo a lot of my rotations and pathing and whatnot here to get the speed out of it. Maybe I'll start doing that on stream, trying to figure out a fast ED3 run, but we'll just have to see what the future holds. Either way, if you're only doing ED3 and you can afford the upgrade, I'd suggest it, but um, overall it's kind of a meh upgrade here compared to the other two. At Solak, they just came out with a solo scaling option, so you no longer have to use an alt account to get yourself into a solo. You can just go in with one person and send it, and it's quite fun. A lot of... I'm not going to really talk about too much the in-depths of how to solo. There will be guides coming out in the future. But what I will talk about here for as far as the bow is concerned, I tried a couple different setups using range. The first setup used, uh, I mentioned it in ED3, is a poison setup. It is basically using a Blood Reaver, Vamp Aura, 
and Bic Arrows to get as much poison damage out as possible. It is quite the fun setup. Uh, it does not give the fastest kills in the world. I think I was getting anywhere around the low to mid eight minute range, which it depends on. Uh, there's a lot of factors going into that. Basically, uh, do I get skips or not? But the main takeaway from this is it is a fun setup to go out and just style camp. Uh, you could do this with any setup, by the way. However, the bow does make P4 a bit easier, being that you have extra hits going out to do extra damage, so you don't have to go inside the realm and deal with that shenanigans. You just stand outside and do a realm list for the 200k, and you're off to the races. This again is one of those bosses that the bow can shine at as long as you're very uh, specific about your rotation and include things like incendiary shot and natty instinct to help you get extra adrenaline. Uh, before the boss fight starts, I did play a little bit with dropping a dummy to get a kind of dummy incend build off, and it was very helpful. However, I was not really able to get close to a root skip. Uh, the solo root skip is 500k, which is quite a bit of damage. I did a few with magic and got a few, uh, I got a few kills with root skip and obviously one cycle core and all that and jazz, and they were pretty nice kills. But with range, I wasn't really getting anywhere close, regardless if I was on the full arrows uh, setup with hybrid, or if I was on this poison setup with bow camping specifically. However, I did notice I was getting anywhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300k MIDS. Sometimes it would go over if I got some really nice crits out of it, and my SGB would uh, hit all five arrows. I think I saw a couple DSs go up into the 350k range, but with a poison setup specifically, you're really going to be lacking on damage in the earlier phases to then make up for damage in the later phases and it is a fun setup however it is do you want to play that balance of sacrificing initial damage to make up damage later on and overall compared to other current you know solo methods this is definitely a slower meta it is definitely lacking in some areas but it's a fun way to go out and just do the boss if you need to break up the monotony as far as hybrid is concerned, uh, I tried out so far a range melee setup. I did a couple duos with a buddy as well as solos with that setup, and they were interesting. They were fun to play with. However, they were slower than magic simply because one, the adrenaline starvation did show. Uh, it did rear its ugly head here. And two, Magic has the Inquisitor Staff up its sleeve. With the Zami update, Inquisitor Staff got a buff, as well as Hex Hunter and Pterosaur Maul, but they all got a buff, and Magic has Inquisitor here, meaning it's a tier 105, uh, basically a tier 105 staff. Technically, it's a tier 104.8 for those who actually, you know, really care about numbers. Personally, I don't too much. So basically, just round up. It's a T105. So Magic is absolutely going to steamroll here no matter what. And it's going to take quite a lot to kind of topple that meta. However, an interesting point where range might come into the meta in the future is hybrid with Magic. I haven't really tested it so far. I've seen one example at Karapak where I think range was used on phase two. Um, although that's a completely different boss, I could see in the future uh, when we get into the uh, potential upgrades and if you should buy this bow or not and talking about all those kind of situations, um, seeing what could come in the future as far as range mage hybrid and other things of the sort. However, at Solak specifically, I think the bow is a nice upgrade for range as a, uh, as a combat style usage here. However, it's going to take some upgrades to make it competitive in a top end sense. However, if you're just going with a couple buddies or you want to run a solo, this is a nice uh, item and setup to use as to kind of break up the monotony if you're trying to do a long term grind. Uh, if you're someone who doesn't exactly care about absolute boss times and kills per hour and stuff, definitely look into this for Solak and for potential future updates. So in my opinion, one of the best places i found for using this bow specifically is at Glacor, specifically at high end rage. I would say anything over 1500%. This thing really shines, especially if you start trying to push with just range or get caught up in like a hybrid setup, which get back to back arms at like a very high end rage. This bow might be able to save you in some of those situations. 
Now, what does Glacor have that the other bosses don't have? Well, that is a giant HP pool that seems to never end. One of the best things you can do here for higher end rage is to use a hybrid setup where you're range camping most of the time, and then you bring a magic swap to deal with the DPS check, at least at like, you know, 3500 plus or 3300 plus. However, you can push the envelope a little bit further with range only, you, or range on the DPS check now, because the bow spec does really help out uh, during that process. It's kind of one of those golden scenarios where at a certain rage you stop using ECB spec because you need the healing potential from Soul Split to save you, and that's where the bow spec comes into play because it doesn't require you to have Soul Split up and lose healing, but you're still able to get more damage out, so it's almost kind of like a replacement at higher end rages. Stack this in with Bic Arrows, and you have quite the combo to get a lot of damage out for these longer boss fights. Back when I did a push to 3k Glacor, I just used a physical SGB, Bic Arrows, and some DPS armor, and I got to 3k, and it was quite the grind. However, I did go back and try a couple kills, uh, trying to remember the meta and what exactly what I was doing, and honestly, this bow was a ton of fun to use here. Uh, within the first couple tries, I got within a close to sub-5 at like 2k and 2500, and I was really pumping out some damage with these Bic Arrows. And overall, this is probably one of the best spots to use the bow, other than Zami, of course, but you know, that's kind of cheating in my eyes. <laughs> Anyways, my overall recommendation for Glacor, if you have the bow, is to use it all the time, and if you're doing a hybrid setup, I would still do magic for the DPS check because it is much more consistent. However, in a pinch, you can pull it out. I would use Bic Arrows and probably Full Arrows as a swap if you want to get that far into it. Uh, you could even try and deal with uh, Splintering Arrows. Uh, personally, I never use those. And I'm excited to see what the cap for range camp specifically is. From what I remember before this bow came out, it was around 3.2k in rage was kind of like the max you could do, simply because it was just really hard to get out enough damage on the DPS check if you got caught with your pants down with like a bad spec order or something like that, or you missed time to DS earlier on. Uh, that was about the cap, and I could really start to feel that uh, pain, so to speak, when I got to 3k. So I imagine we could probably add another couple hundred percent onto that, maybe 3.5k as possible, or who knows, maybe some mad lad will figure out an idea or a rotation or something for 4k using range camp, you know? There's people out there who can do some ridiculous stuff with this game, and this is probably one of the better bosses to use this item currently. Alrighty, now that I've gone over all of the specific places that I tested this bow at, now we're going to get into the discussion of should you buy this bow? Is this a good purchase for you currently? As of the time of recording, which is September 25th, 2022, this bow I believe is still in the 7 bill range, and that's really really expensive for a weapon. That is by far the most expensive weapon in game and has been the most expensive as far as I can rem remember even counting for inflation. I'm sure that back in the day, you know, seismics accounting for inflation were more because they were like two, three bill for the weapon back then. And, you know, obviously two to three bill back then is a lot more than now. But in recent memory, this is by far the most expensive weapon. And for what it does, I simply cannot recommend this bow for the average player. This bow is for someone who already has best in slot magic, probably has best in slot melee, or at least enough melee gear to have an adequate zerk swap for anywhere that they need to do hybrid, and they're working on building out a range uh, setup. You know, they already have the SGB EOF, the ECB EOF, they have a Debo EOF, um, you have your Blights there as a dual wield swap, you have your Karoming swap, either a T90 or a T92, whichever your preference is, and that is when I would say it's okay to go ahead and buy this bow. However, being that FSOA is only half the price and will work at all the aforementioned places here that I have tested, plus every other boss in this game, it is a hard time to recommend this bow right now. So. If you're an average player looking to get into some high level damage, 
and some high level content, I would simply recommend get the FSOA and then use that FSOA to either go ahead and do Zami or other bosses to pay for this bow. That's kind of what I would recommend. And I would put a hybrid swap for some of the bosses that require it, such as Carapac itself and for Solak. Both of those are hybrid bosses and a lot more bosses are starting to get hybrid methods. I would definitely look into getting some type of Lings and Easy K. Uh, with some vestments, armor, you know, something in that realm. You could probably skip the easy K if it's literally just a Zerk swap, but a two-hand swap is kind of nice. And that's where this bow kind of falls in right now, at least for the price point. If it was the same price point as FSOA or slightly cheaper, I would say it's kind of a toss-up. I would recommend the FSOA still over the bow if they were equal price. However, I could see some arguments for people that wanted to camp some very specific bosses. Like if they just wanted to camp Zami and just pump out bows all day, then sure, I would say go ahead and get the bow because uh, range camp there... Uh, can get similar results, pretty much the same results as a hybrid setup with Magic Melee, and it's a little bit easier, but now that they've changed the things there, it's like kind of more comp- it's kind of more complicated now because I swear they change, you know, the drop rates, bad luck mitigation, I swear it changes every five minutes at that boss, you know, metas are always changing, and you know, but if you're going to Zamorak specifically, and the bow was the same price, I'd say go ahead and pick it up. But double the price, I just, I can't recommend it to anyone who, you know, is just building up their first combat style. I know there's a lot of, there's a few players out there who are really dedicated to one combat style, and that's all they want to do, and they don't want to branch out into other combat styles. If you're one of those players, you know, there's not really much I can do to change your mind on that. You can play the game how you want, because at the end of the day, this is a video game, so, uh... If you're bullheaded and want to buy the bow, go right ahead, man. There's no difference to me. However, if you're being a little bit more conscious about your GP, I definitely would work on magic first and then work as rain on range is probably your last combat style to upgrade as a melee swap is going to help out magic even more. So this last segment before I get into the final thoughts on the bow, I would like to talk about some potential future updates that uh, we may or may not see in the future. These are just ideas that I've had or people have had in my Twitch chat and have told me about or I've read just from somewhere else, you know, a lot of discussion going on in this game and I kind of wanted to touch base on a few of those. So since the main problem with this bow is there is a lot of special attacks to maintain uh, with range and not enough adrenaline to go around, I could see some type of Hydrix arrow coming into the game that feels more like a band-aid fix than anything as it kind of eliminates the point of bolts entirely. Uh, Ruby bolts are very niche, uh, mainly only used in record attempts for getting a Ruby SGB. However, for just ca casually using them, I don't really see people using them anymore. And personally, I only really use Hydrix bolts in the first place for my dual wields to get a Gricko swap in and try and get some extra adrenaline to help out this bow. So something I would like to see in its place, instead of going, you know, the band-aid fix of some type of Hydrix or adrenaline gain arrow, potentially Eventually they could do some type of rework to Death Spore because right now that is a very RNG dependent, you know, it's, it's based on crit chance to get an adrenaline save and I'm not the biggest fan of a very RNG based uh, adrenaline game like that. It's, I've never liked Death Spore arrows, it's just a personal like pet peeve of mine. Anyways, I digress. I would rather see something... Uh, if they were going to go the route of Hydrix Arrow, what I would personally rather see is for ECB inside of an EOF specifically, not this uh, physical ECB itself. Uh, they could do it this way as well. Honestly, it doesn't make a whole much of a difference to me. But what I would like to see is if you have an ECB inside of an EOF, that you then have the freedom to then swap main hands. I feel like that would help out a lot right now in the current range meta as you are not punished for swapping back to your dual wields and losing, you know, the 10-15 seconds you have. This would help circumvent the adrenaline problem just because you can go back to your dual wields, get a Gricko off with Hydrix bolts equipped, and get some adrenaline back, and it would make things a lot more nice and start to help fix the problem uh, range has had for a while. 
and that things do not tend to synergize well with each other. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's mainly with main hand locking and a few other things like that where it's, it's felt very, you know, locked to one weapon, everything goes into an ECB, and then once you start a spec, you're kind of locked into that spec until you do something else. Uh, the T95 bow spec doesn't gain stacks. Uh, when other weapons are used, the ECB is locked to its own main hand, and it feels kind of anti-synergetic in that uh, in that light. So I'm not going to say that the special attack should be released from main hand locked on the bow. I think that's a little bit defeating of the por purpose of the bow. However, I could see ECB getting unlocked if they're going down this path to try and band-aid fix adrenaline. One of the better fixes and what I think is more likely to happen with this bow is the T95 armor set. So we have a T95 armor set in game already, uh, the Vestments armor set, and it is a glass cannon armor set. Uh, it has virtually no defense or very little, if any, and it has a lot of damage, plus it has a lot of adrenaline boosting features to it. So what I could see is a derivation of Vestments being applied to range, and then that would certainly help out range a lot. I would also, if they go down this road, I really would like to see ECB unlocked from uh, main hand anyways. I feel like that would be a super nice quality of life. However, uh, the uh, vestments armor idea for range, I'm sure that's in the works. You know, they came out with glass cannon armor. They're starting the T95. We need to see T95 armor for range and mage, as well as dual wield weapons. But, you know, that's kind of a, a different topic. <laughs> But I'm sure something like that would certainly help out range. It saved melee so hard. When Vestments came out, it was the biggest breath of fresh air we have seen in a while for melee. It went from being the most adrenaline-starved, constricted combat style to one of the most free and, quite frankly, very fun combat styles to use. Um, you know, just one armor set can really do that to a combat style, so we will have to see what comes in the future as far as updates are concerned, but I think the most likely is something to do with the armor set, and I think all T95 armor sets are probably going to follow the glass cannon type setup. Alrighty, so wrapping up with my final thoughts on this bow, overall I think this is a solid update for range. I'm very happy with the update as they seem to have hit the balance where it is a nice update to give a niche circumstance here and there, a potential upgrade with uh, room left on the plate for other updates to make it truly a strong weapon in overall combat style. Be mindful that we still have dual wields to see, potential uh, other weapons such as maybe a two-hand crossbow in the T95 category, or maybe something crazy like knives or javelins, you know, whatever they happen to toss in there, as well as an armor set and maybe some other utility items. You know, this is the first T95 to come into RuneScape 4 range, and it's always exciting to see. And I believe they did a very good job on keeping it balanced, you know. It's right in the middle of, you know, FSOA and EZK, being that FSOA was grotesquely overpowered, and EZK was probably one of the biggest flops of a weapon on release. You know, they had to release an ability to double its damage just to make it competitive. So, you know, we don't want the extremely overpowered side we don't want you know the absolute flop eof fodder type weapon we want something right in the middle that's fun to use it's pretty good at other places and when you're filling out a entire bracket of a combat style you know you're gonna see drastic changes in meta based on those updates you know you zoom into like a month or two span you're gonna see some wild changes but then when you look out at the bigger picture at the end of the day, when T95 is all set and done, it's probably going to be pretty balanced. I hope that it's balanced anyways uh, once we get everything into, and it'll be a fun journey to see what comes next. Anyways, though, it's still too expensive for the average player, but if you're a top-end player looking for a new way to kind of play around with a combat style, you're kind of bored with magic range melee as it was, and you just want something new to do to spice up the bosses, go ahead and pick one up, or make one yourself at Zami. Anyways though, let's go ahead and roll that outro. Ladies, gentlemen, and I did not forget about you bows of the Last Guardian, thank you very much for watching. I greatly appreciate your viewership as always. If you're not subscribed to the channel, consider subscribing. We are on the path to a thousand subscribers. 
and I can't believe we're actually, yeah, I can't believe it's actually might be coming a, a reality. Anyways, though, I'm Car Guy. Have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, nighttime, whatever it is, wherever you are, and I'll see you next time for the next video. Keep an eye out for the Range DPS Guide update coming up next. Peace.